Hey, um, hey guys, I'm Kushik Gavini. Um, I work for the Den. I work for the Den. Obviously, I'm doing this talk, and I'm also currently head of engineering at Red X. So we're just like trying to solve the company a little bit here. We're trying to do tokenization of real estate assets, so it brings liquidity to real estate markets. Yep. So a little bit about me, so you know, like the validation aspect. Um, so I'm currently like head of engineering at Red X. I am hyperledger instructor at the Den. I'm past software engineer at Coles R and D, and past DevOps engineer at Robert Half. Um, and I do do a lot of consulting on my own with like enterprises, point blockchain. So before we even get here, so how many people have a basic understanding what a blockchain is or what's important of a blockchain? All right, it's cool, completely fine. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go talk about it. We talk about enterprise, right? Everyone says, oh my God, enterprise, big, big play here. But what is an enterprise application, right? So from my standpoint, enterprise application is basically relies on these um, five attributes. The first being usually enterprise application or enterprise architecture, it's very complex. Um, and it needs to be scalable. Scalable meaning both like growth wise and infrastructure at the same time it needs to be cost effective and needs to be component based, right? It needs to be provisioned between all the employees or users of the application. And most importantly, it needs to be distributed, it means it needs to have some kind of load balancing in it. And that goes back into the infrastructure aspect, right? And most important is mission critical. What, what do we mean by that? So it needs to have low downtime. Right? You can't have, we can't be using a technology that's not reliable or that doesn't have an LTS version out there. LTS meaning it's like stable. So looking at these five attributes, looking at the current blockchain technology out there, it, are there some blockchain stuff out there that fits all five of these attributes? Um, well, you, and I'm not trying to bat talk anyone. There's some issues with all these emerging technologies and blockchain where you have Ethereum. It's really, really expensive, but it, you know, it can meet all these attributes and you have other blockchain technologies, but there's a new side of things coming out that are fitting all five of these attributes specifically. And we're going to be talking about more about hyperledger fabric and why it's mostly the optimal solution to, to tackle these attributes. So, and this is com coming from a consulting background where I'm consulting a lot right now. And this is a meme, and this is actually what's happening a lot when you go to big enterprises. Um, so I remember one time I, I went to um, Arkansas, there's a big company in Arkansas. I don't want to name, bad name anyone, but what they basically, I talked to them and I'm like, why do you need blockchain for your thing? And they didn't have a solution, right? Um, they're like, well, blockchain is X, Y, Z. They watch a YouTube video for 10 minutes. They think they got it. But when you're talking from an enterprise solution, there's more layers to it, right? You can't just be like, let's implement blockchain here, move on to the next buzzword. Um, you need to tackle the problem head on and look at the problems underneath the hood, not just from a marketing standpoint. So coming back from the meme over here, usually, in innovation R&D, that's where most technology implementation, implementation comes in in enterprises, right? Enterprise divisions don't actually adopt new technology immediately. They go through R&D innovation phase for at least like a year or two to make it like POC, MVP level, then they adopt it. So usually when you go to a director, or when you go to, um, like you, you tell them I have this new technology, would your enterprise want to use it? You have to tackle from a digital transformation standpoint, right? And how many of you guys are in enterprises right now that you know what digital transformation means? All right, cool, this is fun, okay. So digital transformation is a buzzword where directors or management will like to use. Basically what they're trying to do is implement new technology to the pre-existing infrastructure that can leverage their business model. So what does that really mean? Don't get disrupted. Um, blockbuster, right? So. And this is, and I'm going to be coming where digital transformation is essential for enterprises, and that's where they want to do blockchain. Well, let's look at Blockbuster here. 
they didn't transform the, their technology to meet the end user goal, right? They, they thought about their um, current ecos technology stack and they're like, it's perfectly fine for us. And I got this really mean, like, like it's like, say disruption one more time. <laughs> yeah, so, and let's go more into the use cases of enterprises, right? The biggest enterprise play where people get a lot of money in companies is healthcare technology. Because um, healthcare constantly has to be improving, right? So when you look at healthcare, such massive field, right? You have pharmaceuticals, right? Getting your pharmacy from um, end user, um, digital records, your basically your devices, your heart monitors are basically IoT right now. They're connecting to the internet, they're processing it, and they're going on your website. So, um, how many of you guys have Kaiser Permanente as your health insurer? So, for the people who have Kaiser, you know it's all digital, right? So Kaiser was actually one of the first technology companies to make everything digital. Um, how many of you guys heard Epicor? Ep Epicor, right? So if you guys know, systems, Epicor, what? Same what? Systems, the same thing. Yeah, I'm talking more of the healthcare company, Epic. Oh, okay. Epicor. So short story about Epicor, and this will come in play later. Um, so Epicor initially was one of the first guys who were like, let's digitalize health records, right? And this is back in the day, like 2000s, right? Massively. And what Kaiser did was they're like, okay, we were trying to do the same thing, but how about we just help you out doing it? We give our engineers to you, we develop it for you, and it's, then we can use your product for you. Why did they do that? Like, no one knows why, because Epicor just tripled in value and Kaiser got nothing in return for it. So one of the reasons it's really complex in healthcare is um, HIPAA. So I don't know if you guys work for healthcare companies, Kaiser, Stanford Medical, and technology fields. HIPAA is the most important thing when you're developing a healthcare company, right? So basically what is HIPAA, it's like this big acronym for like, I think healthcare um, privacy and security standards and all the legal attributes you gotta deal with um, for digital transfers of records. So. So one of the biggest challenges in healthcare and HIPAA is privacy and security standards, right? Every year, there's probably one or two big cases of people getting sued for violation of healthcare um, records, how they handle it, how they transfer it. And if you guys have Kaiser, you think about, okay, your doctor prescribes you something after the visit, it immediately goes on your mobile application saying you're prescribed this, pick it up at X, Y, and Z. To go from there, it's not just A to B. There's a lot of me mediocre steps you gotta put. You gotta encrypt it, you gotta decrypt it using these, pro these standards, and you gotta um, transfer it adequately. So, and this is, and this is like very true, like um, every year or two you get health like you get like a really good healthcare provider you might all have and they get sued by the government. Government actually takes really good care of your healthcare records, um, your data. So let's do a use case right now. Let's do Kaiser Permanente. And I did this because it's pretty big in California, Northern California Bay Area, where, and Kaiser's full digital. And that's why we're doing this use case. Um, so around like a year or two ago, you may, know this, um, Kaiser got sued, right, for $2.3 million. Um, and all they basically did, according to news sources, all they did was they basically mishandled how they're transferring on the protocol level um, the medical records, right? They didn't do it properly. And just like a minute mistake cost them $2.3 million. And most of he all healthcare companies right now, um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make their HIPAA compliance better. And another use case is supply chain. And this is the hugest use case right now that's actually being successful, other than financial services. Um, so especially in enterprise world, traditional enterprises, when you think about um, the IT background, where the main business model of the company is not technology, is something else where the technology leverages the business model. Right, so supply chain is one of the um, really good Examples of that. So in supply chain, 
uh, I know you work the supply chain. Um, the four main attributes right now when I do consulting where customers um, tell me is the four, ma- the four main attributes of supply chain where you're working with supply chain, you want to aggregate the data, right? You want to create some, like, you want to collect the data, you want to create some trends, you want to do predictive mon- monitoring, but, like, the biggest the biggest thing in supply chain, the purpose of supply chain is to make sure your product's quality is good, right? You get all these data to make sure the product's there on time and it's actually quality is really good. And um, for this use case, I'm going to be talking about Walmart. Um, how many of you guys heard about Walmart, what they did with blockchain and why it's so successful? It's like breaking news in the blockchain world right now. So what Walmart did was they basically, um, this is huge problem in um in produce collection from if you're a farmer you're trying to sell it to walmart from a to b the produce gets um expired or it gets really damaged along the way what walmart did was okay on on walmart's trucks there's iot devices supply chain is iot synonymous right now so from the from the moment you step in you put the lettuce or cart potatoes on the truck Uh, It measures the potato weight. It measures the temperature of the potato. It measures the timestamp of it. It even measures like the guy who put it there, right? Um, All these data is aggregating. And Walmart thought, you know, let's create a really good um, blockchain distributed um, database where it's verifiable, right? Because what usually happens is what their problem is, the supplier who puts the potatoes on a car in the truck, um, they don't really give out the adequate temperature immediately. There's the trust system there, right? So you want to create like a trust where you can catch the produce if it's going invalid. So the aim of Walmart project that's just been released right now is to track to track food from the farm to store um, using real time data um, in distributed ledger systems. So how they do this, right? I said earlier, IoT, right? What well, basically means IoT is Internet of Things. So anything that connect to your internet, a hardware device, you can say that's IoT. Um, and how it utilizes the IoT is very important. Um, so what Walmart did was they teamed up with IBM, right? So you may be thinking, IBM, another big enterprise. Why IBM, right? So we're going to be a little bit talking about this later, but what IBM built right now was a very coherent ecosystem, like cloud ecosystem for deploying blockchain related, especially if hacker ledger fabric. So what they did was, okay, Walmart, you're trying to do it. You obviously don't want to open your data to everybody else. Let's do a permission blockchain. We have something we're working on and you can use our cloud system for it. So the case study for Walmart blockchain real quickly is you know they're trying to catch um, tampering, right? Trust issues. Is it the right way of the potato? Who controls the IoT as a middleman, right? Is the IoT data actually accurate? Can you compare with other data to make sure it's the average or just like below average? Contamination huge, right? So, from from a humanistic standpoint, yeah. How do you actually measure if something's contaminated, right? So it goes through the IoT device. They, they get some like they may poke a hole in the potato. They may get some readings back, and through like some automation, smart contracts, they may compare with their actual data. They may get it back and spoilage, temperature, um, humidity, and the date. So as I keep saying in this presentation, IoT, right? So blockchain and IoT are going to go extremely well together, right? If you guys are researching in the blockchain supply chain. The biggest market right now is IoT. How do you include your pre-existing IoT ecosystem and the hardware adequately to supply chain in the cloud, right? And IoT right now, there's two types of IoT uh, computation. Traditionally, what happened was you send the data to a cloud or you retrieve it on a disk and you process it, right? There's something happening right now called edge computing. Um, is any of you guys familiar with the concept of edge computing? Right. So from edge compute, you know how it's like slowly being implemented everywhere, right? Especially like you don't want to send it all the way back. You want to compute it within the network itself. Yeah, yeah. So coming from that standpoint, right? 
blockchain is basically a distributed network, right? So how does that adapt to edge computing? And that's a problem that's being solved and like really hampering down. Because um, if that happens, it's already kind of decentralized itself. So when you put blockchain on top of it, there's more solutions that can come out of it. Um, and Walmart did a really good thing, but think about thing is they're not going to release their answers to anybody. So we talked a lot about the use cases and how it's um, working. Um, so the popular frameworks for um, enterprise blockchain right now is Hyperledger, and you have you know people say Ethereum is an like open blockchain. You can actually make Ethereum private if you want to, but it's going to take some cost. Um, and there's like multi-chain. There's R3. Um, from my standpoint, from a personal standpoint, I think Hyperledger is winning the game right now. And I'll give my analysis and why. Um, and R3 um, Corda is up there. Um, I put them number five just because of the adoption rate. But they have really good board um, advisors in their startup. I mean, in their company that can really leverage their adoption. So this is very important. Um, this may be one of the most important slides. Um, so in enterprises, what's the one thing right now that's in their infrastructure that's been taken? Um, it's cloud service, right? Every big company wants to be on the cloud, right? They don't want to have their stuff on-premise at all because uh, on-premise is very costly. Unless the government tells you you must put it on-premise or you, from a business standpoint, Standpoint, you want to put it actually in your main, like mainframes. That's going to be extremely. Amazon Cloud Services is uh, sort of an example of a very few. So, uh, what might yeah. be a uh, very encouraged? So, there's a thousand of them, not yeah. three of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. This it's a huge thousand of ones. Sorry. A thousand of the, uh, out there in the cloud, distributed yeah. storage and processing services. Yeah. Not a top three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, cool. So I think I think what you're trying to say is that like AWS is availability availability regions, their um, endpoints, their global hubs. Is that what you're trying to get at? There's like I'm a, trying to get at uh, the two few players. Yeah. Amazon, Google, big guys. Yeah. But uh, you need to open it up at least uh, a twenty fold or uh, fifty fold more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that. So going back to this uh, diagram, so and this is very important, right? So if if you're an enterprise on the cloud, you want to have it um, a platform, a blockchain platform that's adaptable, right? So if you look at it, like you have Ethereum, right? So AWS does support Ethereum. Um, it does have some functions for like cloud template. You can pursue it. Azure and Google, I don't want to talk about Google just because they're very secretive right now and there's no answers for it. Um, but if you look at this guy, Hyperledger Fabric, look at how many compatibility there is. You know, Amazon want to work with Hyperledger Fabric, Azure, IBM, Oracle, SAP. And there's a reason for that, right? So, and the reason is this. And this may be like a joke you guys may know in the Valley. IBM is probably one of the best company to do R&D, create really innovative products right now in some software, but they're really hard. What they do, the bad thing is they really quit when it's really hard. And an example is, um, a recent example actually is IBM Watson, right? What happened to IBM Watson? Like around three years ago, you heard IBM Watson all over, commercials, everywhere. IBM Watson is going really big in healthcare, right? They're analyzing healthcare trends. Um, actually, when you're sick, it can actually predict when you're sick um, through these, all these services. But what happened? Why didn't they continue? Um, usually in IBM's problem is they have really good engineers building stuff. They have really good business people selling it and doing the product roadmap that's somewhere between they don't have a technology business guy who knows the in between so from this standpoint from a developer community hyperledger fabric is supported by ibm but it's not owned by ibm so it's owned like through open source through linux foundation 
So regardless if IBM quits on it, there's a lot of players like Oracle is heavily investing in hyperledger fabric development. So it's continuously going to grow. And that's where LTS comes from, right? If you're an enterprise, what, how, like if you're, if you're doing hyperledger fabric implementation, you're going to trust the guy with the biggest, best engineers on the team building the product. You're not going to trust some guys like, especially if it's open source, um, when it's in production, some software that's not validated yet. So, and this thing, as you guys might all know, if you're an enterprise company, if you're a CTO, right, if you're chief of innovation, what are three attributes that you look for before you adopt a technology, right? You look for time, cost, and past success, right? Time meaning what's adoption, rate? like how, does, how long does it take me for me to actually deliver on the business use case? Cost, how is, like, what is the cost rate? And past success, and this is actually really important right now, especially new innovation technologies. Um, past success, has it been tried before? And if it's been tried before, what are the failures, right? How can we build on top of it? Or successes, how can we repeat it, right? Um, and this is the main reason why Hyperledger Fabric is winning right now. Past success. Um, IBM, I mean, Walmart just blew the game right now with IBM. They really took Hyperledger Fabric out there and they're really doing consulting services to delivering. So as I mentioned before, Walmart, um, there's some talk, there's some, in two years, they're trying to make it in two years. If you're not on their block, private blockchain network, if you're not a supplier, they're not gonna buy from you. Imagine that biggest retailer are not gonna buy from the farmers, uh, produce supplier just because you're on their blockchain and why would a big company like walmart even try to initiate that move it's because the past the success of their blockchain implementation so and we're going to go a little bit more technical right now um the justification why enterprise applications especially blockchain platforms are really being successful so this is a uh, MIT technology review that's been released, I think, in summer. Um, has anyone looked at this article or? Yeah. So picture says a thousand words, and this basically says the article, what it's trying to say. So you have like hype, right? The crypto hype was there, and that's where people got introduced to blockchain. And there is a hope, right? Decentralize everything, make it more democratized. But what's reality, right? What's actually practical right now between one to 10 years, where is it gonna go? Um, and permission blockchain is that space right now, um, especially proven technologies like Hyperledger Fabric. If you can actually adopt your um, business use case using that, uh, you're gonna go far within one to 10 years. After that, it's, there are gonna be new players in the game, definitely. Do you guys have any questions right now? You guys wanna ask me before I move on? No, is it, all right. Is it getting interesting or is it getting less, less interesting? All right, have a cell phone back, okay. All right, so from a technical standpoint, we have three main objectives, right? Hyperledger, what is Hyperledger in itself, right? Um, who knows Hyperledger, what it is, high level standpoint, all right. And why do we need Hyperledger? That's actually more important. Why the heck do we need Hyperledger, right? And we're going to be focusing on Hyperledger Fabric technical components just because you need to understand what's underneath the hood, right? It's not just like, it's like going back to the meme where you talk to a guy, we need blockchain, but you got to justify why you need blockchain. Not just from a business use case, but how the technology is going to leverage your solution for your business use case. And it's very um, good to understand the technical side. And uh, hopefully, I don't think we're going to do this bill or a uh, very own permission blockchain, but I'm going to demonstrate what I just, uh, what I did. Um, and I, it's going to be very interesting on the demo. So what is, what is, before we talk about Hyperledger, we need to talk about Linux Foundation, right? We need to talk about open source, right? How many people are, know the different licenses in open source? Like GNU, all right, cool. Um, so for open source, it's not, there's some really good, there's some protocols out there if you want to use open source technologies, right? 
for example, you can't just if a guy in if a guy creates an open source technology, you can't resell that unless there's some licensing or there's some legal work. What Linux Foundation did was um, they're very smart, and as you know, their their success rate is massive, right? Node was cre created by them, right? Think of how many enterprises use Node right now. And just imagine this, if you guys, who works currently for an enterprise? Like a big company, like, okay, like, okay. Um, and what's the number one thing where, and then we talked about this before, right? The four, the five attributes. Why don't enterprises like open source traditionally? And, and why is Microsoft changing that? that? That's a bigger question. Why, why, that's, why don't enterprises love open source? But, yeah, yeah, enterprises love money, but why, okay, if it's free, it's free for them to use too, right? Um, but why is it? And it's, it's good, better, it's caused about stability and security, right? Who are you gonna trust? You're gonna trust some guy out there, some organization, and you're gonna put like millions and billions of your like budget into adopting this technology to solve your business use case. Would you actually trust that? Most open source things fail, right? That's given. How you make open source successful is the organization that actually runs it. You need to have some kind of governance. And that's where the Linux Foundation does a really good job. Um, look at Node, right? How many people would have thought Node would be as successful as it is right now? Look how many JS technologies, especially server side, that actually were, came before Node, right? And how many of them successful and have you actually heard? And the reason for that is because the Linux Foundation has this really strict guidelines how you develop the product. So you you're trusting the name brand Linux Foundation more than um, Node itself. And number two is they actually engage the enterprise players, right? So what they did was Linux Foundation and IBM was they both came together initially to create Hyperledger. Um, sorry, let me. Um, so Linux Foundation had an idea to solve blockchain. And what do I mean by solve blockchain? What was the problem with blockchain when it's open? Privacy. Sorry, anyone want to answer? Privacy. That's one use case, yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. There, there's a lot, actually. There's a lot. lot. Exactly, scalability, TRX, right? Um, there's more, there's actually costs, right? Your infrastructure costs on the back end. That's huge for IT enterprises. So what they did was, well, let's create this kind of ecosystem project where Linux Foundation will run it, organize it, govern it, right? Create the rules for these players and get all the big parties, IBM, Oracle, Almost every Fortune 500 company right now is dedicating their time and resources to help this project out. I mean, you may, you may be thinking, and this is actually a good question, you always ask why rather than, right? And that usually gives your answer. Why would a enterprise company like Oracle, right? IBM has a cloud service, Oracle has a cloud service, right? Why would Oracle spend a lot of money to build on top of an IBM supported dictated project like Hyperledger Fabric. Um, anyone have like any question on that or answer for that? So you have like IBM, right? They developed Hyperledger Fabric, they put millions of dollars into it, and they're really successful. They base their whole cloud service majority of it on the blockchain, on the BAS, BAS platform to deliver Hyperledger Fabric. And you have Oracle there, like, Hey IBM, let me help you develop the product. Why would a competitor in enterprise actually um, help each other out? It's a very rare occasion, um, and the, and the answer to that is you see the whole landscape of technology changing, and um, where open source through Linux Foundation, and other governing sources are actually creating really stable technologies. Um, so the answer to that is Oracle did their own cloud BAS platform of Hyperledger Fabric. So they piggybacked off IBM's um, development and they created their own service. 
So you're gonna see a lot of collaboration now in the coming years. Before it used to be like, I don't know if you guys know the story how, why we still use Windows on our laptops. Yeah, exactly. But why do many, why do many people use it? If you guys didn't know, there's, I grew up in the Bay Area, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, so you hear the stories. Um, uh, Bill Gates was basically an a-hole, right? So he was a really good a-hole on top of it. So it's really smart business acumen. When basically Windows, uh, DOS, right? When DOS came out, you got an answer? Yeah, because um, for who are working in like engineers, Microsoft is better, right? Because Apple is not easy to code. And, uh, like some programs are yeah, yeah, well, there's more operating systems other than Apple, but yeah, yeah. So, like, the main answer is basically before this time, and we're living in the time where collaboration and open source are actually being prevalent. Before, what they had was a a company developing this technology and they keep it for themselves and destroy other technologies. Um, Linux was actually out there when DOS was out there. And what Bill Gates, inf I forgot the company and what they, he infamously did was he bought a Linux company just to destroy it, right? I forgot the specific name of it. It was a very popular brand. Um, so right now you see with the Microsoft direction, you, you see a guy, Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, and you see right now, Microsoft, come at me, open source, I love you. Um, and that's really dictating other companies to really collaborate with each other. So, and we talk about open source, right? So what is Hyperledger Fabric, right? So Hyperledger Fabric has five main frameworks. So you have Hyperledger Burrow, and actually Burrow and Hyperledger Fabric are combining together. And, um, and you have Hyperledger Indie, yeah, Hyperledger Aurora and um, Swatooth, which is really good for supply chain, actually. But you have these tools. And um, how many of you guys are, use any of these Hyperledger framework, um, tools or frameworks before? Or have a, some kind of high level understanding? All right, cool. I'm just trying to get where you guys at. But the tools is what makes it really powerful, right? Um, I never did Ethereum development in my life. But I know there's a lot of great tools for Ethereum, but there's a lot of monetization for those tools, right? And that's very important from a developer standpoint, especially from a um, startup or company standpoint. Um, and that's why open source is really beneficial for the little guy and the big guy right now, is these tools are being supported by Fortune 500 companies. And I'm not talking about one or two engineers, their annual budget, each company is going to put in $30 million, right? Every year, and you have like 500 of them for majority of these tools. Um, and this is where it's coming from. The landscape is changing. Like, I, I guarantee you all these Fortune 500 companies, they don't care if their competitor beats them in the technology department. Because at the end of the day, if they actually are happy if they beat them, because they're going to use the same technology the competitor used now because it's open source. And that, that, that's why it makes the tools and the framework so good is because you have everybody working together. Not, there's no competition around anymore. And I talk about these later. Um, so you have, and we're specifically talking about Hyperledger Fabric. So what companies are extremely, like, extensively and exclusively using Hyperledger Fabric? IBM, Oracle, and Walmart for supply chain, right? And let's analyze it from just a high level standpoint. So, um, so this is the big one right now. The big one is basically this, right? Consensus. And this is where it comes. I don't want to talk about it, but how many of you guys are familiar with, um, have you guys ever developed or sold or inside an enterprise application or enterprise tool? Ever used an enterprise tool before? So can you tell me what, in your opinion, what are the top three things in an enterprise tool you like you look for? 
if, if you're, for, for example, if you're head of the, if you're a tooling department in your company and you want to set up the tool for your employees. Well, I'm not a tooling department, but uh, customizability. So mm -hmm. the tool that does the best job for our specific service mm -hmm. is usually what we're looking for. Yeah, okay, cool. So that's actually the answer is looking for is pluggable, right? And that's extremely important, right? So if something's not working, because you want to create a generic ecosystem where the technology you use, different types of technology can solve the business use case adequately, right? And it's not going to be, life is not like perfect, but you want to make sure it's flexible enough so you can make the circumstances per like optimal. And another thing is, um, for, sorry, for the program language, right? Adoptability. Look at the languages. They're very like mainstream right now, right? Go Java, the big language in the back in the day, and JavaScript. Um, and you look at the competitors, right? Um, Solidity. Yeah, you heard the name before, but how much of you guys have like at least five, six years experience in it that you can crack it down in a huge application? Um, and then uh, you have Serpent. I'm not sure sure what that is, but you take you take why Hyperledger Fabric is enterprise friendly, it's number one, modular and pluggable. Number two is adoptability. And you have to take a look from the business standpoint. Are you gonna retrain your engineers to learn a new language and how long will that take? If not, are you gonna hire a consulting company and how good are they actually gonna be? So we talked about these a little bit earlier. Um, let me skip this. So, and we're gonna be talking about Composer, but um, Composer right now is built by IBM, right? It's, it's, not, it's built by IBM, it's mainly built by IBM, but they don't own it directly. Um, but they did a really good job, and this is where the analogy comes in. IBM does really great things, but they never continue with it. And I have no idea why they, don't, why they do that, actually. Um, so what they did was they created a very developer-friendly tool to be an abstract layer on Hyperledger Fabric. So you can prototype, and actually at that time it was production-ready level, right? It was, they're trying to get production-ready level. What they did was around like three or four months ago, they said, screw it. We're not going to develop a Hyperledger Composer anymore. Um, but you have other people working on it. But IBM had like 70% of the resources, and obviously the 30% of if you only have 30% of other companies, it's going to take longer to make it like LTS ready level. So um, we're going to be talking about Composer because it's still like popular right now. But right now, in production ready level code, it's native fabric. Um, but it's good to learn Composer because it gives you the high level understanding of Hyperledger fabric. So um, why IBM created Composer is reduce run like time to um, re reduce time for deployment, and really easy business model uh, capabilities in JavaScript, obviously. So this is very important, right? Why do we need, um, this is just a Hyperledger Fabric, but why do we need Hyperledger Fabric? Um, we need to understand what is a DLT. How many of you guys know what a DLT is? All right, cool. And what are the challenges of a traditional DLT? DLTs were there even 10 years ago, right? Um, what were the challenges of DLTs, right? And how does white label blockchain solve it, right? Why do we? Why are we actually using blockchain? Why can't we just use a traditional DLT? Why can't we just create one from scratch? So what is a DLT, right? And this is just an image I found, and I'm taking word by it. And um, it's basically like a distributed ledger in a network that records ownership through a shared registry. That's very self-explanatory. Would anyone want to add to that, the basic uh, definition of a DLT? That was a good example. Yeah, I'm talking from a tech, technical standpoint. I don't know how they handle the transactions, right? But from from a UI standpoint, yeah, it is, right? So I presume, yeah. So challenges with implementing a traditional DLT, right? Concurrency, privacy, confidential, access control, right? We talked to enterprise grade. If you, how many of you guys use AWS before? All right, so what's the main thing why AWS won out other than the huge um, services available is provisioning. Like IAM, IAM was one of the big reasons why AWS 
came out. What I am basically tells us, yeah, you're a developer, you're a front end developer, don't touch other stuff, right? So you can restrict who can do what. Um, and DLTs, you have to manually create those because DLT is a shared ledger, right? Distributed ledger um, and standardization, right? So what a DLT is, is basically a database, right? How do you create companies database A standard, like compatible standard database B that have to be some kind of standard rules? And um, communicating between huge enterprises is extremely hard. If, to get everyone on the same page is extremely hard. That's why standardization is extremely hard. And it's scalable. One of the biggest problems in DLT is why people don't use it 10 years ago. It's not scalable. Um, you have these, you have a lot of hype when DLTs were came out actually 10 years ago, even before blockchain. Let's use distributed databases. They're basically DLTs. The reason they stopped using it is extremely complicated and it's not scalable. Concurrency. Oh, sorry. Actually. oh, so concurrency, sorry. Um, so in concurrency, as I said before, anything in um, technology revolves around real life, right? So concurrency basically means in the English language, I, I, I think, I don't want to say first, but yeah, simultaneous time. So we're talking about distributed DLT, and what I just said was just DLTs are basically a database. If you're breaking down bare bones, you have company A, makes, uh, let's say, all this car for $10, right? And company A is basically the dealer. Uh, company B is the guy who ships a car. Um, but company B wants to know what price company A sells it for. It's for their own um, analytics. How do you make it happen at the same time? Right? Um, that's called concurrency. That's a very simplistic standpoint. But you, when you're dealing with huge transactions, um, think about when you... Sl and this is a very, very interesting fact. Um, think about when you slide a credit card when you want to buy something. Um, hypothetically, right? Optimal scenario, I don't know if this is legal. What if Visa's collecting your records, right? So how does, well, Visa can just buy it from Ross or someone, but hypothetically, what if um, Visa has a database too that collects the information that some retailer collects too? Um, then there needs to be concurrency. Does that kind of explain that, or would you? That makes sense. So it's ha happening at the same time. So let's go a little bit more in depth, because this is very important, why Hyperledger Fabric and why we need like uh, DLTs in the first place. So concurrency is actually the factor to more events or circumstances happening at the same time as we talk about. Privacy and confidential, right? You want to make it very secure, right? And this, the more stuff you have distributed out, the harder it gets to secure it because you need to create like some firewall or security groups in cloud we talked about um, that actually um, do accurately. Cloud security is one of the biggest um, solutions right now in startups. Um, this is the main reason, right? Distributed um, security for cloud computing, it's extremely hard. Think about how you manage like 50 different databases to, or services or nodes in the cloud talking to each other and how do you create a coherent firewall around it? That's really complex stuff. And um, if you want to do everything from scratch, it's extremely hard. And standardization, right? So anything is just, if you break it down to bare bones and people are going to yell at me, but it's just a database at the end of the day, right? You, database was a huge rules, right? It's basically a database. And you talk about standardization, right? They all need to be the same standard so they can like be compatible with each other. They need to have the same standard so they can have the same rules and regulations inside the database. And what is the cost of them, right? Being the same standard, right? Interoperability, compatibility, that's basically it. Um, this is a really bad image, so <laughs> take it. Scalability, right? You need to be scalable for your enterprise. Um, so you guys, you guys heard this, or you guys must have saw this in blockchain, right? Pick one, right? One meaning you want to be scalable, or yeah, pick one side of triangle. You want to be scalable, or you want to have security, or you want to be decentralized. You know, you can't have all three. That's 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 what we're trying to say. Traditionally, and this is where blockchain comes in, and this is big, right? So we talk about okay. So we talk about all these problems, right? 
If you want to do from scratch, if you have the best engineers on your team, you pay them like, I don't know, a lot, uh, they can do this, right? But at the end of the day, the scalability is extremely hard to solve unless you have some kind of underlying concept of a technology. Blockchain is a concept, right? It's not a specific technology. And the concept of blockchain or decentralized computing, or oh, sorry, sorry, that's it. The concept of blockchain really solves this, especially from a DLT standpoint. Um, and we're gonna be talking about that later. So, and this is gonna, actually gonna answer this question right here. And we're gonna go over it real quickly. So, yeah. There'd be, uh, try to understand it, I want to get metrics, making transactions, but then somewhere else, yeah. there must be the data, because data would be conceivably uh, huge. Yeah. But you want to think about transactions, uh, we look at the uh, on the chain. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're talking about some data on the chain, it's like transaction value, and some data not on the chain. Because yeah. data would be uh, yeah. huge. Yeah. And so it's like, uh, chains. Good yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Exactly. And we're gonna be talking about it later. Um, I want to move a little bit faster because are you guys getting bored of this? It's gonna be really technical. Real quick. Yeah. I have a question on the previous slide. Yeah. Is this scalable trial on that in any way connected to the cap theorem? Sorry. The cap theorem. Could you explain the cap theorem? Or cap theorem is. Uh, for distributed systems, there's yeah. a trade-off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. And availability yeah. and consistency. Yeah. It relates to the case. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it does do that. But um, we're gonna be talking about how specifically one type of blockchain solves that issue. Or right. solves it is a very bad word. Right. Really makes it better, right? But it's a trial solve like. So, so. It adds like a, um, give me a second. So I was, I was gonna talk about in the technical side underneath when you open the hood, why it actually gives you more leverage to actually kind of get a combination of scalability, some sort of scalability, some sort of security and some sort of decentralization. All is like a combination of both. Instead before it was like, I wouldn't say it's like binary, but it's more like binaries, tribe binary. So does that kind of make sense? It's like a more combination underneath the hood. Um, let me talk about it a little bit further, and if you have questions, please hit me up. What? Combinations, two things taken three at a time, or three things taken yeah. two at a time. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, um, so Hyperledger Fabric, right? Um, and I'm presuming none, none of you guys heard this, or under you guys know uh, architecture for it. So I'm gonna go over the basics and hopefully, actually, who knows the basis of Hyperledger Fabric architecture and underneath the hood stuff. And I'm just taking a vote, who wants to learn? Okay, I was still saying, this is, this is like, okay. So before we do this, um, so Hyperledger Fabric is built for business applications. They didn't even try to say they wanna decentralize the whole thing. It's like, nope. Whatever your business needs, traditional, we're gonna solve it. We don't care about anything else, and there's gonna be trade offs. Um, and yeah, your answer is correct, but there's gonna be trade offs. So, what are the characteristics of Hyperledger Fabric, right? It's permissioned, um, there's a lot of provisioning, and they just said this, but they don't need gas, or this. there's no such thing as crypto in there. And it's automatable, right? Smart contracts, that's for everybody. Um, so who, actually, I don't want to answer this. What is a public blockchain? Can anyone give me Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Um, what makes public blockchain? I know the answer's right there, but <laughs> basically anyone can participate and transact on the network. That's a very layman's terms answer, but there may be more rules involved in there. Now, what is a private blockchain on top of that? It's basically, you get to decide who does what. So it's what's happening. And there's like a consortium and there's like rules in there. So we talk about these, let's go a little bit more in depth, right? So permission blockchain, there are three main attributes, authentication, right? KYC, AML. Hey, let me ask you guys a question actually. Um, 
how many of you guys are working in a blockchain company that's open blockchain, that's solving a business use case? So could you talk about that, your business use case? Or um, what, what, what's your... Uh, underlying root chain was public root chain. Yeah. Uh, using um, uh, either permissions or public sub chains to enable uh, intro organization transfer of data between devices. Okay, cool. Um, so for, and this is a one, oh, sorry, you, is someone else raise your hand? Oh, uh, AirTM, so what was Bitcoin? That's sort of a, um, not really business side. Okay. So, so um, one of the biggest things, and we talked about earlier, is authentication, right? So for a healthcare company, we talk about, and this is very optimal, you got to know everybody who's going to access the, your data, right? Your, basically your database, you call it your ledger. You don't even want to keep it a 1% chance people can get it done. It, that, that, that's just like, that's basic. Um, you don't want to be liable for that. And access control, right? So you want to restrict some rules for each entity in there. Um, like who can see why, like um, can a doctor see another, his other patient's records or did, can he only see his patient's records? And uh, can he prescribe something to a patient? If he's a psychiatrist, can he actually prescribe, I'm not a medical field, like I don't know, injections or um, cold medicine? Um, you can, and that's a very high level viewpoint, but if you can get to discrete computing, you can actually get more, what nodes can talk to other nodes, right? What nodes can actually do some other um, actions against each other? It does, and that's why people don't say pr private or permission blockchain is not blockchain. Just because, like, it's not open or it's like, right? But it's like a very blockchain that solves a lot of the issues that traditional DLTs um, have. Um, transaction validations, right? Carried out by a subset. Okay, so basically, who can transact what? Uh, before I go any further, do you guys have any questions that you guys want to interrupt? Just one question. Yeah. So you mentioned that there's no online cryptocurrency. Okay. Um, so what's the incentivization for companies to send out out to uh, basically business relationships. I mean, if you're a business, you really don't care about that S word, right? You in kind? Yeah, in kind. Yeah, you, you're you like, okay, whatever. We're in business. This is multi-billion dollar businesses. Like, we're not going to play around here. Right? So, and this is why it's for, they're, they're, High Pleasure Fabric fundamentally just says that. This is a business application solution. We don't care about anything else, right? Incentivization. Because we presume business are responsible. So, and one of the key attributes is confidential transaction, right? So certain participants are in control of the transaction. Um, I go a little, little bit more, more in this um, better, with a better image later on, so just keep this in mind. Anti-encryption, no need to incentivize network for validations. Participants decided who and how of validation, right? So you're, you are a business entity. Two business entities talk to each other. And they basically say, yep, this is a deal we made. And that's how usually business relationships work, right? They're trying to um, solve the technology standpoint from business. And this is just automation, smart contracts, right? That's basically what it's saying. And this is uh, one of our last sections. Um, so components of Hyperledger fabric, right? So what is an asset? What is a chain code? What is the ledger? Um, how does everybody knows what I hopefully everybody knows what a ledger is, but how does Hyperledger Fabric define a ledger, right? Um, and that's very important. You got to know what the definitions are from each side. How does the interaction between an asset, chain code, and a ledger look like from a very high level point of view? Um, and and if you guys know any open blockchains, you can actually compare and tell me how this interaction is, differs from the open blockchain. Um, I think it's gonna be like a very good um, topic for people. So what is an asset? In English dictionary, and I like to say this, everything in technology reflects in real life. So how do we define assets in real life? So it's basically items of ownership that can be convertible into monetary value. How does Hyperledger Fabric define an asset? 
Um, basically, it's basically over the same thing, but they're saying it has to be over the network, right? Um, transacting over the network, uh, bordering the system using the Hyperledger Fabric Network. Okay, so chain code is smart contract. How many people understand the basic fundamentals of smart, the purpose of a smart contract? Uh, would you guys like to say why people use smart contracts in blockchain? Systemic intelligence. What? Systemic intelligence. That's a very big word for that, okay. Systemic intelligence. Um, I'll, I'll just like to say it's like, basically from an underlying standpoint, um, you're writing rules that can they can talk to each other and what actions talk to each other. Um, and this is a very big point right here. Many smart contracts run concurrently in the network, right? And that's true for um, even open blockchain, but how, how does the computing power in the back end and IT infrastructure happen? That's very beneficial. Um, all right, so in a, per, in a permissioned blockchain and permission network, right? How many of you are familiar with permission network? I just wanna get that. All right, so let me break it. I think we, permission that network differs from public network. So permission network is basically, um, guys, see my mouse, okay, cool. So you guys can um, see this participants is like, you know, your business guys, right? This can be Apple. Um, and this is actually your CA certificates. In Hyperledger Fabric, your CA certificates are your, um, your the two sides to this. There's your infrastructure, your how many peers you have and nodes, and then you have your private and public key, right? So your business guys, these private and public key has to match with your, um, your main users in the business network. And if they don't match, the whole thing shuts down, right? So, and, and that's how they check who can access your, the tr the circle here is the network, who can actually access it, who can actually transact on it. All right. So instead of this image, let me just show you this. So, and this is very, and this is very, gets like really um, good. I, I think this is where it solves many use cases, Hyperledger Fabric. So pretend you have some manufacturing companies, right? Um, where, yeah, this whole thing, they're all, they're sharing one ledger here. The blue can represent one network, right? Right now there's one channel. Um, you guys know what channel means in English, right? Uh, could someone say it? Do you guys have any idea what channel means? Well, basically, a path along which uh, something can flow. Exactly. So, path along which something can flow, right? English channel is a, it's like geographer, like geographic term for that. Um, let's go for this, right? So, we talk about the blue as a channel, right? One business network can have like A, B, C, D, E companies talking to each other in the same network. But what happens if you want C and E have their own private relationship in the same business use case, right? Um, what happens in this transaction or business use case, they all corporate, they all corporate around each other because none of them steps on each other's toes, right? But what happens if C and E were like, um, a and C are competitors, but C wants to talk to E to undersell A or something like that, right? You can actually create a private blockchain or like another channel, another layer of privacy where C and E are actually talking to each other and they're creating their own network here. So think about it like this, right? And this is where um, I believe LSE is using it. London Stock Exchange is using um, Hyperledger Fabric extensively is pretend this is London stock exchange itself, right? Um, so you have all these like companies, they wanna list on it. So what happens if with two companies wanna transact information or London stock exchange wants to talk to one company individually, you basically need private channels for that. I'll go more into this later in a live demo where this is actually more applicable. 
So in a permission network three, you know, we talk about this later, authentication, um, known identities, access control, and transaction validations. All right, confidential transactions. So participants are in control of the visibility of transactions, right? And we talk about this later, like, um, this, if A is a competitor to B, right, this, does B want A to see the transactions as he's dealing with C, right? What if C sells to A and B, right? But why would B want A to know what he's buying from C? Does that kind of make sense, guys, right? So traditionally, tell me if I'm wrong, in Ethereum or Open Blockchain, can you create something like this where you have many networks inside it permissioned inside each other. So that's that's actually one of the use cases why you need permission for enterprises, right? This is a very solution friendly for enterprise businesses. Um, chain codes automates the business processes, right? This is all the rules and regulations. So, and this is uh, actually getting interesting right now. So an asset in Hyperledger Fabric basic terminology is just defined by a JSON and binary representation. Yeah. Um, real quick, go back to the yeah. last slide yeah. that you talked about. Yeah. Two separate entities with nodes talking to one another. Is this one? Or, uh, yeah. How is it different when it's, for example, peer to peer or permission? Oh, this is permission. Um, but how is it not peer to peer? But how is it not peer to peer? Yeah, so it, no it, it, I, work, um, two separate nodes can talk to one another. Uh, without any operating permission from an entity, right? So no, no, they, they need permission from each other. Oh, from but, each other. Yeah, but this is just saying it's doable, right? Okay. But um, let me see. So these are the rules they, they basically tell you. Yeah, you can communicate with each other. Um, so, so let's go back to this a little bit. So your question is, how is this different from P2P or? How is this different from a peer-to-peer -peer kind of transaction? Yeah. It, it is very similar to peer-to-peer, -peer, but you have rules and regulations on top of it that solves okay. the issues of traditional peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Um, that's why most people say permission blocks, like this type of stuff, it's not really blockchain itself, but, but it solves a lot of use cases for it. Um, so a chain code is smart contract, it automates it. Okay, so Ledger, everyone, I'm, Hopefully everybody knows what Ledger is, it tracks all asset transactions. Um, and honestly, all participants have a replica of the Ledger in a DLT. And this gets what's really interesting, and this is where like, um, from you gotta put your engineering cap on for this. So in, in Hyperledger Fabric, we separate the Ledger into two components a transaction log and a state, I don't know what you call it, like state ledger or something. So how many of you guys are you familiar with um, when, I'm gonna give a real life example, Redis or any caching service, like on the browser, why cookies were made in the first place? Mm. Until, uh, yeah. Ooh, they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Previous yeah. Exactly. And another reason why cookies. Well, there, there's a work around that, but cookies were the optimal solution. And work around that was uh, let's think not good cookies, right? Let's do cash, right? In hardware, why was cash created? Faster retrieval, right? Um, in computer hardware, you don't want to go all the way to the like your. Um, your ROM all the way to get something out. So quicker service, right? So what I mean by that, and this is where you have to put your engineering cap on. And traditionally in, um, and this is, what, this is what I heard in a study in Bitcoin where everything is in one transaction, right? Everything's huge. Okay, pretend your, your, your application wants to query that. Think how much computation power it needs to query that. Even you have like what, anytime optimal search algorithm, it's still gonna take a long time, there's more data. But what Hyperledger Fabric did was like, we don't need that much type of 
really good on trustworthiness. We know we can trust people, so we can segmentize the ledger. So what they did was the state ledger is basically the current state of the value. Okay, so if you have an operation on your application, give me the current state or the most recent state. You can just query the state ledger. You don't have to query the transaction log and waste your time. Trans Does that kind of make sense, guys? Yeah. And um, for this, as you, you can't update or create in a transaction. So it's a one, one meets all, right? Um, it records everything. If there's 15 different updates, the transaction log holds all 15 of those updates and you can't delete anything. But on the state ledger, you can delete stuff, right? It's like, trans, it's like a um, traditional CRUD, basically. And both of these, right, um, are affected by the smart contract. So um, you guys learn about level DB, anyone? Level DB, um, couch DB, traditional node SQL databases. So um, I forgot who created level DB. Um, I think it might be. It's Jeff D. Huh? Sorry. Jeff D. Jeff D. Um, there, yeah. Oh, that may be correct. I don't know. I didn't Google. So um, there's a competitor. I think couch DB was created by Google. So. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like they were supported by Google. Do you guys know who created CouchDB? Anyway, so I, this is the story behind it, but um, LulaDB was initially used, if you guys used it before, it's very simplistic, right? Instance and relational database. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's like a very simplistic, right? It's a very simplistic um, NoSQL database, right? It's very simplistic. Um, and that's why people use for it, so you can get faster throughput. So from this, right, an asset represents a value, and you can define the structures and how the transaction changes the uh, value through the small contract or chain code, we call it hyperledger fabric. And the chain code adds the transaction record stage to the ledger appropriately. We have two types of ledger I talked about before, and you can optimize it during chain code. Yeah. And this is a very um, important public key infrastructure. Um, have you guys ever played with PKIs and enterprises before? Right, they're very complex too. Um, traditionally, you have your own IT enterprise defining the rules for your PKIs. You can actually do the same thing, right? Customizability. And I'm pretty sure in other open blockchain, you have private and public private and uh, public keys, but the whole point of it is you can actually customize it even further here. To enterprise grade level PKI infrastructure. So let's talk about real life example here. Um, so so all three are, we call these um, entities members, right? So you have Tesla, the manufacturer, and supposed to have a dealer and repair shop. They're all part of like this one network. That's what we're trying to say here. Um, so an identity is managed by waste certificates. Like same thing, I'm pretty sure in open blockchain where you have private, private key who can come in, who can access. But the problem, I mean, the solution we have, a more optimal solution is um, the member can actually create the requirements for who gets uh, for the certificate authorization. So like, if you go back here, there's probably like 500 different nodes, I'm, I'm presuming for the manufacturer, right? So the whole, the main node of Tesla manufacturer can actually define the rules, who can, who's representing Tesla in the network. That's basically what I'm saying. And through this, uh, the tool is called membership service provider. So I wanna ask you guys a question. We're talking about like, um, Identity here, right? There's a lot of emphasis on identity, right? And and customizability of PKIs, enterprise grade level ready. Um, so, do you guys are you guys understand the difference between this and a traditional, you know, blockchain service where it's not enterprise ready level? Traditionally, you just have 
one fits all, right? A really good public and private key, not really customizable, but here you do. There's like a layers and layers of identity you can put on. Um, the purpose is that Hyperledger Fabric is very customizable, such that you can fit all your business requirements. So um, I think I went over this channels so are peers connected to channel. Um, basically two entities talking to each other, right? And um, this is a very good example of what happened. Sorry. I just have a question. When you said that DKI equals identity. So sorry, sorry. Like, what do you mean by identity? Like, identity, ident uh, identity of an entity, right? Entity, yeah. So, so, like, so going back to the Tesla model, like, yeah. Yeah. So sorry, Tesla. Oh, about Tesla yeah, both. Because here's how it works. There's like scalable levels, right? It's, think about this. Okay, so let's talk about passport. I think I think this is where it comes from, like a passport. If you want to go to a different country, you get a visa, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Unless you get revolutionary, not going to do that later. Yeah, yeah. Let's not talk about that. It's going to be whole. Okay, you get a passport, right? You get a visa. Um, I don't know immigration law. I'm just making it up as I go. Like, so, and you go to the country, right? Let's talk about identity from that person. Bob wants to go to Canada. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so, very good. Very good. Thank you so much. So, the visa, right? There's little different types of visas out there, right? There's student, I don't know, I'm not immigration, but there's student visas, a work visa, green, green, you can say green cards, have, I don't know. Green cards have a visa, there's a lot of stuff, right? Where you want the customizability of the identity itself. So yeah, so you can say like, pretend A is Canada, Bob can go to Canada, he can do certain stuff on the identity, but pretend these are different countries, if, they, if Bob wants to go to C, they have the identity what he wants, right? It's more customizability. And you don't have that much power in open blockchain because it's, it's, it's very like they don't trust anyone. So if you don't trust anyone, there's only one solution to it. Yeah. Um, okay, do you guys have any more questions? All right. And um, this is very big important. Certificates are issued and revoked by certification authority. And we talk about this, right? Your, your uh, members have a certificate authority. So basically, you, you talk about your embassy or something, cert certification authority. And um, yeah, the members can revoke your identity and create identities. And they also can create the participants also, who can, who can represent you in the network. All right, so members can participate on multiple BC networks. Now, I think I showed you the answer before. Um, it's this one right here. So this one, this what, this what it's saying. So you have all the members, A, B, C, D, are one private network. On top of that, you can have another network on top of it. And you just, just think from that scalable standpoint, so these guys are going to have different identities altogether now. So when you're in this zone, right, this can be, think of this as like an EU, right? You have like different identities. If you want to go to like another party, you can have different identities, different rules and regulations. So you can even customize even further. Um, and that's why we talk about Hyperledger Fabric, the customizability to solve a business, um, business problem. Is that on the same blockchain? Like yeah, it's, it's, on the, it's actually on the same blockchain. So it's like a side block, side block. Yeah, block. They're called, this is called a channel. A channel represents um, a network representing members, which is basically a blockchain network, right? Um, inside that network, you can create different mini networks talking to each other. And just by me saying this, can you guys think about like a business solution where you can be like, this could be actually adaptable? Like you can have mini networks inside business blockchain, I mean, like a huge network inside different stuff, um, miniature. And you see this in a supply chain a lot, right? Um, this is very useful in supply chain. Um, so, and we're talking about a little bit of my project later, um, but 
you're going to see this. So if companies don't want to share all their information, they usually create private networks with each other. All right. All right, um, so this is basically your identity. This is your stamp on your passport. Um, what happens is you have a user initially, he goes to the application and he wants to talk to this node, but unfortunately this, this node pretends it's a country or something. Um, he doesn't accept the user, right? He's like, we don't trust you. You don't have the proper um, authentication. So the whole thing, what happens is they all coordinate accordingly and they reject the transaction, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so this is very big. We talk about it later consensus, right? So what is the consensus of the hyperledger fabric? To be quite frank, right now it's PPBFT, is a team fault tolerance. Um, I think it's, yeah, uh, I think the P stands for um, practical, yeah. I was thinking that I want to say, I was like, it was wrong. Um, so, and the reason you shouldn't really worry about your consensus if you're developing hyperledger fabric is basically, um, I don't know, let's think about like a random company like Intel creates another consistent algorithm like suitable for Appalachian Fabric. You can basically in the future, you're basically gonna have like a menu where you're gonna want. And it's gonna be so scalable too. You can have different networks inside. Like we have a huge network inside the same network that can be different consensus for each one, right? Think about the custom ability, what's gonna solve enterprises. Fine, let's, ha let's, let's actually put uh, proof of work, right? Basic proof of work, huge, heavy stuff on the big entity we saw here, right? right. Let's, make, let's make this have a different consensus, right? And you can have, make the mini network a different consensus than that. So you can have customizability for your business solutions. And, um, and they're really easy to implement, right? So um, I actually wanna ask you guys these questions right here. No concept of mining, no need to incentivize and no crypto coin. What is the fault for having these? And where can Hyperledger Fabric not solve a problem because it can't do these three things? Right, so Hyperledger Fabric can't do these three things. Is there a business solution just because it can't do these three things? It can't solve. Yeah. And I would say uh, uh, this is uh, taking some of the ideas out of uh, the uh, cryptographic blockchain technologies and uh, holding it in terms of uh, continuing. Mm. The current enterprise structures, yeah. as opposed to uh, say, no, we're not after a revolution that you change the society and the economy at all. Exactly. Okay, that, that's actually a very good answer, right? Yeah, that, that's basically what hyperledger guys who created hyperledger project wanted to do, right? But I'm talking more specifically, what solutions can, oh yeah, you talk about high level solutions, change the world and revolution. Let's talk about even further, what type of revolution use case can this solve? Um, just like basically from my standpoint, basically any use or application where you want to, where you can't trust anyone, right? If you can't trust anyone and you're assuming all the guys are bad, you're giving them a lot of freedom to do whatever they want in the network, right? So um, basically that's why. So it's for more business enterprise oriented where the users are known. Oh, this is actually what I did. And um, so this is very high level here. Um, it's not very clear, but I'll walk through it. And this is very high level. I don't expect you guys to understand, but I expect you guys to understand the workflow behind it. Are these notes, these slides, going to be accessible through uh, uh, the uh, link that the five person found this against? No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, no, just 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 because like I, this is like 
I'm not. A bit, I don't run the den, but I'm pretty sure they don't give free stuff out. But it's gonna be on YouTube though. If you want to watch me talk or hear me talk for like hours, to get to this point. No, this yeah. So let's talk about this for a second. All right. So if you guys work on an application, uh, enterprise application, this looks very sim similar to what it would look like in um, enterprise. And I'm expecting for an answer why it looks similar. Well, there's one key term why in any enterprise company they use this. They have this method of using it. You don't even have to understand the peers, um, but this is really a thing, right? Um, maybe let's walk through it. Maybe you guys will understand. Um, so essentially what happens is, pretend it's like a application for IoT we talked about, curry result, right? Um, please find me the temperature of the produce. It goes to like SDK, right? You guys all know what SDK is, right? Right, so um, when you're developing on Ethereum or Bitcoin, is there an SDK for that? Like a generic SDK? I think there is, right? So basically, you, th there is, there is, the answer is there is, but the difference here is, um, these are all customizable and modular components. So in enterprise, if you look at traditional enterprise architecture, um, what they do is it's very a lot of tools combined together. Like most enterprises don't develop their own solutions. They integrate pre-existing solutions and somehow manage it cohesively together. And that's what exactly what happened here. You can, as I said before, the consensus of the chain code can be pluggable, right? Um, so you can think about this as a, um, a little bit, this is very exaggerating, but you can think about this whole application of microservice architecture too. And that's where most enterprises are going for, where each service is its own tool. If, um, but it's not there yet because the chain code breaks, the whole thing is gonna break. Um, but they're trying to get there where it's like more modular, where each um, service can be replaced without hampering the whole thing at once. So yeah. So that's the talk here. And before I go to demo, would you guys have any questions overall? And did you happen to get the solution to find your, um, to the triangle thing? I'd like to talk about that actually further. Terminology in this chain seems to be a chain code and a very many few others you see as part of yeah. it. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that continues uh, to uh, my questions would be a uh, chain code or uh, a smart contract would be in the other systems hmm. on the chain yeah. and immutable. And so if bugs are found, that could be a real problem. If yeah, bugs yeah. are found long after the fact, it could be a real problem if a, a code yeah. is going to be in their um, very event immutable. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me just get what you're saying translating out there to everyone. And please correct me if I'm wrong, OK? So you're, you're, the point you're making is if the code is immutable, if there's issues, if it's in production or something, it's going to be really hard to fix. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So could you please describe that? Because hyperledger fabric is immutable too. There's some instances. Uh, the, the chain code is supposed to, as in the other, be Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is that where you have to get all the votes out? Yeah. On a, a private internal test network? Or exactly, exactly. So um, what he's saying, sorry, I forgot. I don't know your name. Frank. Frank. What Frank just said was, just, I want to reiterate to everybody. Frank said one of the main points he understands is, Pretend you're a smart contractor or something, or it's in production. Production defining whatever you want production to be, right? There's different types of production. Um, and there's an error in the chain code, and you want to fix it. So what's the downtime and what's the refix time, right? Um, so in Hyperledger Fabric, it's more quickly. 
compared to open blockchain, because you have a lot of people, right? It's there's a lot more layers to actually fix something and reiterate it over it, and it takes a longer time. Um, you just said test network and main mainnet, right? Exactly. So that's actually a very good point. Um, so let me just walk you through some of the code. And um, this is actually, I translated this using Hyperledger Fabric natively to Hyperledger Composer, just so it's easier to um, understand. It's not your glasses. Yeah, I, I hope, yeah. Uh, you guys can't read it. So let me just walk through this, right? Um, I actually, this actually initiated early, so, um, so what we have is here, let me put this, and this is actually good. So, okay, so imagine, right? And I'm not saying this is true or wrong because I don't want to be sued. I'm using very selective words. Uh, so actually this is in public, so I don't care if I, um, okay, so I don't know if you guys know this, if you have an Amazon package, you can actually return it in cold store. You can, you can physically return the Amazon package in a Kohl's store. Amazon, I'm mean, sorry, Kohl's is more of a real estate place now. That's where retailers are merging. Retail as a service, right? Um, where you have e-commerce stores, they're relying on big physical locations to handle their traditional retail services. So what that means is your Amazon customer, Frank, bought really bad stuff at Amazon, I don't know, you bought like cookie or something. You're like, dude, this is not my type. I wanna go return it, it, it calls, right? Just from the whole process, imagine the whole different layers. Now you're talking about Kohl's supply chain. You have to connect it with Amazon supply chain. Think about how many different nodes are representing that, right? Just from a um, high level use case, right? You have to talk to the request, on Amazon e-commerce, you have to talk to a physical store where Frank gives me the package and the associate scans it and the Kohl's distribution center where they get the truck, they put it in the warehouse and they transport it to Amazon distribution center. And think about all of the IoT devices, right? So there's some trust issues because traditionally Amazon and Kohl's, Amazon's gonna kick them out of the business. Kohl's just doing this just they wanna be relevant. There's a lot of trust issues Right, and this is where the optimal um, blockchain solution is, especially permissions. Right. So an example of this is pretend um, what's Amazon's competitor. Um, for example, what if Kohl's also handles another e-commerce, right? Um, and that's competitor to um, Amazon. If they had a traditional blockchain network, Amazon can basically see what Kohl's is handling for the other company. But using Hyperledger Fabric, you can create inner networks between the whole ecosystem where it's segmentized. Does that kind of make sense, guys, right? So um, having said that, let's go walk through this. So these part, what a participant is, right? Just in English, a participant represents an entity, um, a member in the blockchain network. So. Amazon e-commerce is a request that represents Amazon.com. Kohl's EFC, e-commerce fulfillment center. I learned that the hard way. I had to learn what supply chain and retail meant for like a week or two. As an engineer, it was not friendly at all. Um, and I actually learned there's a lot of IoT devices. I took them all out because they're sensitive to Kohl's APIs. Um, so, so Amazon fulfillment centers, Kohl's DC, um, cold store. So for, for example, what I'm trying to say is this right here. And this is very simplistic. Look at the conv convoluted network that happened, right? Pretend you didn't use blockchain and use a traditional DLT. And you put your engineer's boys, get to work, do this from scratch. Uh, it's going to be really fun in uh, time for them, and it's going to be, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be optimal or accurate, right? So what I mean that by that is right here, right? You have Amazon e-commerce, right? There's one node right here, but we can easily, like, um, let's see if this works, create another node, right? You can have, like, a thousand 
you can go to n right you can have a thousand participants right so this is basically where it requests right pretend frank lives in um san francisco and he wants to go to the nearest kohl's retail store to physically return it right technically frank has like fifth like a, any physical retail store in america frank can go to frank possibly wants to get a plane ticket and return the cookies in washington dc hypothetically if Kohl's store has it you need to have a technology that can track it or some crm right or some kind of tracking enterprise tool that can actually track it um it gets very convoluted for that right it's very a permutation problem right at the same time it's a um, little bit of a combination if you think about it so having said this, I calculate this with the demo in I did in Kohl's R&D. There's easily more than 100,000 possibilities with this scenario. Talking from all the IoT devices, it's extremely hard to track. So what this represents is basically a tracking mechanism. And you can go on transactions and a, for example, if you're an admin, right? Um, you can see on this JSON format, it's basically a ledger. You can see who created what, what was the request ID, what was the customer name, customer email, et cetera. And that really solved the business use case. Comparatively, if you were to use this on Ethereum, it would not be optimal or any open blockchain, traditionally what you have right now, right? Um, and I just want to say these three things to summarize everything. There's a lot of talk I did. I hope one percent of it you guys actually kept, right? Um, so just these three things that I want to reiterate: why an enterprise hyperledger fabric is very important and is taking off right now. Is um, I talked about this right? Cost of time, right? Adoption. So you can think about hyperledger fabric as a tool. By um, it is a tool. Yeah, um, thanks boss, I got it. Um, so it's like a tool, right? It's open source tool, right? Um, and they actually made like a white label around it. So it's basically one fits all solution to it. So it's faster to adopt. You look at past success, tremendous success with what IBM did. Um, solving like, I think it was like 92% improvement, um, somewhere in the high 90s on their produce supply chain. And London LSC, sorry, London Stock Exchange is fully on it. A huge stock exchange is fully on Hyperledger Fabric. And we're like, okay, so why would you want to use permission blockchain for stock exchange financials, right? There's reason business models we know for it, and there's adoption. And third thing I want to talk about is cost, right? A scalability cost. Um, when you take a look at when you, when you take a look at the concept, right? This is just like human nature. You don't have to understand technology. It's easier to solve things when you know you can trust people than to assume everybody is wrong. Because when, when, you, when you assume everyone is dangerous, you have to put more layers to solve it, right? When you put more layers on the stack, it's obviously more heavy and it's not scale. It's, I guess, less scalable. But when you have some rules in place where you can say, yeah, these people are trusted, and these are the rules I trust them for, right? KYC, AML procedures. And um, so, yeah, those are the three things to talk about. And do you have any questions? Give me a. Yeah. Um, the anti money laundering yeah. and these things are questions. Yeah. I'd like to sort of raise my attitude as uh, wanting to evolve with systems. Yeah. Where there's a, a whole bunch more privacy for persons. Yeah. And a whole human, a humongous, less amount of privacy for the upper level enterprises. Yeah. The bigger they are, the less privacy of the Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Um, do you guys have any last minute questions? Otherwise, I'm done. Thanks. All right. Hopefully you guys didn't get too bored. Like you guys could have walked out any moment. I wouldn't have got mad. So quick, quick, quick plug in here, yeah. uh, really quickly. So we're from the Den. We're a blockchain academy uh, based out of Cuba and Santa Clara. Uh, we provide training for individuals as well as organizations. 
So we recently just partnered with UC Irvine. Uh, we're looking to close more universities this quarter. Uh, we've got kind of two different courses. Uh, we've identified that as people who are more focused on open source projects and kind of decentralization, while on the other hand, there's people more focused on enterprise. Yeah. We've got an eight week long hyperledger development bootcamp starting in Santa Clara on Sunday. Uh, and we've got a launch for developers 14 week long bootcamp starting on Saturday. Uh, now, the cool thing about us is that we try to put the risk as much on ourselves. So we have a essentially like an ISA model. We only take $500 up front, and then we'll collect 5% for your salary cap, $5,000, which is an amazing deal. So we're focused on, on building. We're focused on, on really creating these collaborative environments where we can take products to the market. And if any of you guys are interested, please let or a question for Ash. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I just want to reiterate, so in our, in our program, I think this is why I came up with the DEN. We're, they're actually talking to real life enterprises. So um, I think in an organization, we're trying to get Oracle coming in. Um, so Oracle is actually going to be like actively developing our course to their standard, um, what they want us to use, what their Oracle cloud servers and how do you implement it. And um, yeah. So it's going to be very industry level stuff. It's not going to be like one guy teaching it. Yeah, and by the way, yeah. actually, we had a letter from IBM. Yeah. Review, actually, yeah. I didn't. I guess we didn't sell it good enough. Yeah. <laughs>